Hello, welcome everybody. I have with me today Robert Spencer. Some of you may know him from his website, Jihad Watch. Um, I'm going to introduce him. He's the author of 21 books, count them 21, and uh, they all have a broad theme of jihad, um, Islamization, and other related topics. So, my first question, Robert, welcome, is uh, how did you become interested in jihad, as it were, or in a uh, in extreme islam you may say um and when did that happen this uh, goes all the way back to when i was very young about six or seven my grandparents were uh, exiles from the ottoman empire and i knew them of course many years later but i would ask them about life over there and they told me how wonderful it was and so i would ask well why are you here then and they were exiled. Why were you exiled? Then they wouldn't tell me. So I started to study on my own. That led me pretty quickly into Islam and Jihad. And uh, by the time, uh, by the 90s, I was consulting with some individuals and groups about issues uh, related to terrorism. And then after 9-11, was asked by one of those groups to write my first book. And I've been doing this ever since. So with regards to what you could say are the core uh, security <clears throat> services or defense uh, departments, it's, uh, it's 30 years or 30 years plus that they've recognized this issue. But I, I mean, I'm not really old enough to have known much about it that long ago. But what I see more recently is a, a concerted effort on, um, on behalf of and by Western governments to downplay any uh, issues and it's come to the point almost where stating clearly and concisely what's in the Quran has almost become hate speech I don't know if you have hate speech in America I hope you don't but um, yeah it's a, it's it's a pretty serious uh, charge against people that's used to quell any uh, concern do you see that in America oh very much so yes it's very much the same the same weapons are used in Britain and in America, but anybody who speaks honestly about this. And I should clarify that I was not consulting for government organizations. I did train FBI and military groups for uh, about five years in uh, from, I believe it was 2004 to nine or five to 10. And uh, <clears throat> that was government of course, but before that, in the 90s, I was consulting with individual organizations. This idea that, I mean, that is non-governmental organizations, the idea that the uh, discussion of the motivating ideology behind jihad terror is somehow uh, hateful and hate speech and is wrong is uh, been a strategy that Islamic groups and leftist groups have been pursuing for over 20 years now. I remember, uh, not long after 9-11 being on a show, uh, an American news show, I believe it was Fox, but it might have been CNN, which was much different in those days, with Ibrahim Hooper. And uh, actually it was MSNBC, I realize now, because it was Keith Olbermann. MSNBC, of course, is very far left, would never uh, discuss these issues now. But after 9-11, there was a certain openness that uh, everyone had about them because nobody really knew what had happened. And anyway, uh, I explained at Olbermann's behest that the, a lot of the same ideology that had fueled the attack on 9-11 was being taught in American mosques, as well as mosques all over the West, and uh, gave some evidence of that from surveys of those mosques. And Ibrahim Hooper of the Council on American Islamic Relations responded, Spencer's just a hate monger. This was very surprising to me at the time because in the first place he didn't answer or even try to answer any of the evidence that i brought forth and now i'm of course used to that that we get, deal in facts and they deal in uh smears and defamation and uh genuine hate speech but also it was the first indication that the strategy that these groups were going to follow was to label any honest discussion of the motives and goals of jihad terrorists as hate speech and shut it down as a result. Yeah, so the idea for me, the thing that I find most preposterous, I guess, is, I mean, if Christianity uh, became, 
I don't like if ideas from the Bible were um, promoted above others, if uh, some verses that could potentially justify uh, violence were used wholesale and by by governments, um, I could quite easily distance myself from that by just merely quoting other verses. Although, of course, we don't have abrogated verses in the New Testament. Um, it's just the idea that it's not connected to verses such as fight the unbeliever, fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day. I, I don't, I think there's such a cognitive dissonance, potentially mainly on the left, with, with an image that's being sold um, that just simply isn't true. If they would just go to uh, a mosque and hear them, like I don't, I mean, do you, do you have any ideas or any, uh, what's the word? Like, do you, do you have any idea what's going on? I mean, that's a basic question, but why would uh, democratic uh, or republic, you know, why would these Western countries embrace an ideology that at its core has their founding uh, faith um, in its crosshairs, I guess? Well, we have to understand all this. There, there's a great deal that can be said about all this, but one of the main things is that the West has discarded Christianity. And this is important for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is what's written in the holy book is not seen as relevant. Uh, the Christian churches don't teach what's in the Bible. They teach other things. If you go to an Anglican church in, in, in England or Scotland, uh, they're going to be uh, talking about uh, social justice and racism and uh, all these things that the liberal churches in the United States teach as well. They're not going to be talking about the gospel or the teachings of Christ, uh, except in so far as they can be used to support those political agendas. So you have to understand their understanding of Islam against that backdrop. That scripture really, well, it says all sorts of things, but in the first place, nobody really takes it seriously. And in the second place, it's only useful to try to manipulate people who are religious believers to do what we want. And yeah. so they see the Quran says, kill them wherever you find them. And they think in the first place, Muslims don't believe that because we don't believe what's in the Bible. And in the second place, they assume that they can just uh, pretend that it's not there or emphasize other aspects of the Quran, and Muslims will happily go along because they don't realize how deeply rooted these teachings are in Islam as, as, as a whole. It's not just a few random verses. I remember also many years ago uh, a show that my friend uh, Pamela Geller was on, and I believe that was CNN. The, uh, there was a Muslim cleric on with her, and the host asked the Muslim cleric, is there actually any passage in the Quran that some people understand wrongly as calling for violence? And of course, the, the, the Muslim cleric was very shifty and uh, insincere and oily, and he uh, reassured her that there, there were no such passages. But the idea that she said, is there a passage that people misunderstand? It didn't occur to her. It wasn't even within the realm of possibility as far as she was concerned that this might be core, mainstream, oft-repeated Islamic doctrine, not a matter of a few random verses that nobody pays any attention to, but a matter of the, the teachings of all the different sects, all the different schools of Islamic law, a universal and mainstream understanding within Islam. That idea has been ruled out entirely in the West. And if you even suggest it in Britain and America, you're the problem. Yeah. There's no discussion of it. They just assume, oh, you must be a terrible person if you even think that's a possibility. So I think, I think the, in the, other words, yeah, the approach of authorities in Britain and America it's all based on fantasy. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I was going to say that a better question may have been, are there any verses that are uh, not misunderstood, but understood as that? Because the, the Quran, as you know, is clear and concise. That's one of its uh, miraculous, I think, um, manifestations. It doesn't need a tafsir, although we, of course, have a tafsir, many tafsirs. 
but um, some they of them are, are, yeah some of them are pretty conclusive there's no need to go and ask somebody else does this really mean smite the unbeliever because there's not many ways i mean for the whole thing of jihad meaning struggle and an internal struggle and stuff like that i mean smite is pretty universally known as smite uh chopping off hands i don't think there's a metaphor for that really like a, but, but i digress so, well you know the yeah. whole chapter of the quran chapter eight called al anfal spoils of war there are no spoils of war in a spiritual struggle. And it says you have to come back from the struggle, from the jihad, and give a fifth of what you've won to Muhammad. Well, how are you going to give him a fifth of your spiritual struggle? Obviously, they're talking about warfare, but people don't, they don't even take that much time to think about what's right in front of their faces. I guess that with, I mean, similar to cultural Christians, and uh, Yasser Qadi recently mentioned, uh, I think he said normal Muslims or the average Muslim needs to know this only, which for me would have been a huge red flag if I was, if I, if I was a Muslim, because I'd want to know why do we only get half of the truth when you seem to have it all. But I think potentially there are cultural Muslims or Muslims uh, definitely in the UK who don't know these verses because I have friends who are Muslim who have grown up with, obviously I don't generally make it a point of a dinner conversation but the, but when I do quote verses apart from being quite surprised that I know them um yeah they, they're not aware of them or they don't see the bigger context or they feel that they have a bigger context and that be, as as the best example for mankind it can't possibly mean literally what it says on the page even when you bring a tafsir even when you bring corroborating uh, verses so you mentioned uh, Pamela Geller, whose work I've seen. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, both she and yourself were, um, how do I put it politely, uninvited from visiting Britain, uh, I think for five years or three to five years back in 2013. Yeah, that's what it said, but it's really a lifetime ban. Nobody's going to revisit it. Yeah, we I was, just, yeah, I was going to ask, is it a permanent? Yeah, well, it's, I'm not going to pursue it any further. Uh, if they want to notify me that it's removed, then they can. They know where to find me. They sent a, a, a letter right here to this office uh, back in 2013 saying that I was banned, and they can write me again saying I'm unbanned if they want to, but I'm not going to try to uh, fight it anymore because we spent quite a lot of money appealing, and our appeal moved up through the court's in Britain, and then finally they, the, the court threw it out and said, the Home Office it has the authority to ban people, period, end of story. Well, we weren't actually disputing that the Home Office has the authority to ban people. We were disputing their doing so on the basis of the smears and defamation that was given to them about us in the dossier from the leftist group Hope Not Hate, and from, uh, what's that fellow's name, Fiaz Mughal, uh, who you're probably familiar with. No, you're not. Uh, no, anyway, no, I don't think so. Yet another of these Islamic supremacist, uh, quite influential people in the, uh, for the, he's not in the US, in the uh, UK government, but he is influential among the members of the UK government. And consequently, they, these, the, the things that they said about us were taken at face value. But it's noteworthy that they did not claim that we were calling for violence or justifying violence. They didn't really say anything except that we said things they don't like. What they quoted to me, what they said to me in the letter that they sent me right here was that I had said that Islam has doctrines of warfare against unbelievers. And that I might say that again if I were in London. And consequently, they weren't going to let me in. Now, Islam does have doctrines of warfare against unbelievers. I was just thinking that, yeah. Anjum Chowdhury and plenty of other Muslims in Britain will tell you that without any hesitation. Exactly. But it's not, what they were doing was scapegoating us and trying to create the equivalent of the jihadis that they were prosecuting. And Theresa May, not long before she left office, made a speech in the House of Commons in which she mentioned us by name proudly saying that she had banned us from Britain just as she had had deported Abu Hamza and Abu Qatada. Now Abu Hamza and Abu Qatada were terrorists. 
they were plotting the mass murder of English people in England. They were trying to kill people. We were talking about defending Britain from Sharia, from jihad, from violence by people who believe that God told them to kill people who don't believe. And the, the, Theresa May was actually behave, speaking as if we were the equivalent of these terrorists because she's got a large Muslim constituency in Britain. The conservatives have it, labor has it. They have to pander to the Muslim communities in Britain to get their votes. And so they had to show that their counter-terror apparatus was not just working against Muslims, but also so-called far-right extremists. And that's why they persecute Tommy Robinson and others in Britain. And they have created this fiction that in the first place that we are far right, when all I have ever, all either of us or any of us, anybody I've ever worked with, all we want to do is preserve our societies as free societies, as republics, as places where people have equality of rights before the law and so on. But they paint us first as far right and then as extremists akin to terrorists. It's a massive con job, but it's worked very well for them. I think there are a few things I'd like to pick up on really. Um, for me, uh, far right, as it were, seems to be a term exclusively defined by what I can only call the far left, <laughs> for a start. The bandying around of the word Nazi is something that really does boil my blood because there are potentially, not anymore actually, but there are at least a family of, pe of genuine victims of genuine Nazis uh, back in the 40s who, I mean, it dilutes the the power of the word, and words are important. Um, I don't believe they should be legislated against in any form unless they're, you know, threats of violence or, you know, those uh, prerequisites to like law and order. Um, in terms of, yeah, I suppose when I was listening to you speaking, I, I was thinking that if Islam in its entirety or just those violent verses is to be painted as somehow uh, separate from um, from reality uh, as a some kind of persecuted I mean yeah if it's to be portrayed as peaceful which Theresa May herself came out I think the day after a terrorist attack an Islamic terrorist attack not just a you know random terrorist attack and said this is the religion of peace when uh, Barack Obama said that the future does not belong to those who slander uh, the prophet of Islam when you have these um, world figures um, supporting and purporting to believe these things, then anybody who opposes them must be uh, de facto, uh, well, I guess far right, or I don't even know what far right means. I, I kind of do, but I don't know where it sprang yeah. from. Yeah. They're just trying to, you know, that's why they bring in the Nazi, because everybody hates Nazis. Nobody supports Nazis. There might be some Nazis around somewhere, but we're talking about a small group of morons, a small group of idiots, a small group of people who have no influence and nobody is following them, if that. So they take us who are speaking out for freedom. They put this name on us because they know it's powerful and they know that we will have people think that we're terrible people if they call us this. And it's the same with far right. Far right doesn't really mean anything except we are people the elites don't like. That's all. I think even in terms of the small group of, of people who, uh, you know, advocate for national socialism or maybe they're just like role playing something from the 40s. I really don't know. I think that what's good up until now um, with regards to the United States is that they are still allowed to openly uh, speak about their views, whether or not they encounter, I mean, nowadays, potentially violence and writing and stuff like that. They're at least given the opportunity or the rights to say what they feel, because as far as I'm concerned, if people can't say things out loud, it affects their ability to think. If you, if you can't um, voice your opinion, nobody will ever be able to tell you in a loving way, that's a really bad idea, like that's not the case. Um, so when you restrict or compel speech, so it's going both ways in Canada for the LGBTQ, I don't know how many letters there are on the end of it, everyone except me potentially, I don't know. But so there's compelled speech there and there's massive restrictions on speech 
even though nobody seemed like it's always a story of somebody else we had a case in scotland where a guy it was ridiculous he, he a practical joke he taught his uh puppy or his girlfriend's dog to lift its paw like all dogs i think are taught that generally but because he did it with some nazi um like every time the dog heard a certain thing it did that he was actually prosecuted and convicted um it's just bizarre because it it's draconian in a way and yet we have rioting stabbing shootings um mass protests during we have the corona act in this uh country where we were restricting the mass gatherings of people apart from certain protests that wasn't enshrined in the law um but there seems to be a huge double standard that i don't see how it's going to be reconciled do you have any ideas on i mean where do you see it going is there any hope of like i don't yeah do you see any hope on the horizon There's always hope. Uh, I, I tell you, I was uh, I was born in the state of South Carolina. The state of South Carolina has a motto. Every state has a state motto, and the state motto of South Carolina is "Doom Spiro Sparrow," which means "While I breathe, I hope." And so, in the first place, it's not over, even if we lose entirely and the United States and Britain become. Uh, Marxist communist dictatorships or Sharia states or some combination of both, then there's the resistance. There's never, it's never final. It's never, oh, we lost, that's it, we give up. There's always hope. But I don't think that we're going to get out of this very easily and that it's going to come easily to have uh, a victory because the double standard you're talking about is exactly what the Islamic groups want to establish. They, that's what they're trying to do because Islamic law, Sharia, calls for Muslims to have a superior status over non-Muslims. And that superior status is characterized in the first place by a prohibition with carrying the death penalty of criticism of Islam. And so when they see Theresa May and uh, Boris and all the rest of them denouncing critics of Islam as if they are terrible people who must be silent, they see them as instruments of Islamic law. They are actually doing Allah's will, which is to force the unbelievers into silent and silence and submission regarding Islam. And so they're very happy to see that. But then the more that happens, the more the people of each nation are going to say, this is not acceptable, especially in America where the freedom of speech is such a bedrock foundation of our society. There's going to be strife about it. There are concerted efforts to take it away, but there are also many people who are not going to be willing when it comes down to it to allow them to take it away definitively. Yeah. When you say, um, I mean, the, the, the rapidity, I guess, um, if you look at I don't at know it, if our connection is poor now. I don't Hello, know. Can, can you hear me? me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, very good. Okay. I was just saying that um, you, you're saying, it, you know, we won't get out of it easily, but we seem, I mean, I'm only looking with nostalgia, um, and that can obviously be rose tinted, but we seem to have come out of common sense pretty quickly. Um, you know, if you look the last 30 years and maybe just a blip in the history of both of our nations, um, I, me personally, I, uh, other than prayer and uh, publicizing cases of Christian persecution, that's my primary focus uh, recently. Um, I was praying for a focus and then I got that and I got it really um, strongly. Um, there are specific cases that would literally curl your hair up, not you personally, the viewers, because I'm sure you're, you know, I don't have French. hair. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the case on the inside. But um, one specific uh, case that recently has, has uh, come to light and changed again, there's been a massive plot twist, is a case that I brought up in a video maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, of Maria Shabazz. She's a 14-year-old Christian Pakistani girl. Uh, she was kidnapped at gunpoint by more than one 
I, I was going to say gentleman, by more than one man. Uh, she was forced into an Islamic marriage with one of them. She's uh, been required to take the Shahada, which for anybody who doesn't know is like a pledge of allegiance or a, maybe like a baptism or I don't know. Like, it means you're a Muslim after you say those magic words. So that's, that's happened to her. She's, I mean, in this country, she's clearly a child at 14. When it was brought to the uh, local sessions or the courts in, I think, Islamabad, um, the judge rightly um, ignored uh, the accused guy's pleas because underage marriage is still illegal in Pakistan. And yet he argued that she was 19 when she was kidnapped at gunpoint for this marriage. Um, she was ordered to be put into a women's shelter. Her mother had a heart attack uh, during the trial. I can't imagine the, I mean, she was missing for ages the absolute stress um, but then four days later unfortunately the higher courts have ordered that she returns to her abductor and I guess uh, carries on doing the housework or I don't really know do you uh, I mean with the articles that are written uh, on your website do you tend primarily to focus on individual cases or more broad trends or countries as a whole do you have any preference as it were even though it's all pretty like unpleasant uh, reading and researching. Yes, it is. But we, we try to cover as much as we can all of these things. That case that you're describing, we have recently published an article about, and we've covered many others like it over the years. Of course, this is yet another example of the phenomenon of love jihad, which is uh, the ongoing phenomenon in Pakistan and India of uh, Muslim men, actually it also happens in the West, but it's not spoken about so much here. Muslim men uh, marrying non-Muslim women and either the women convert to Islam or are uh, uh, left as non-Muslim, but then the children are raised in Islam. And the idea always is to uh, increase the Muslim community at the expense of the non-Muslim community. In Pakistan and India, this often takes the form of these kidnappings because they know that the non-Muslim uh, population, particularly in Pakistan, it does not have the power to do anything about it. And in India, to a tremendous degree, doesn't have the will to do anything about these things. And so they keep on happening. But anyway, uh, yes, at Jihad Watch, we cover that. We uh, also have extensive categories. If you, you can search uh, for by country and see everything happening, in terms of jihad in any particular place, as well as uh, articles about general tendencies. It's, it's all there for uh, 17 years now. We've been covering these issues and have a database that is unrivaled in the world for anybody who is serious about wanting to know what the activities of jihadis are in all their forms and all over the world. Um, yeah, th so the, the last uh, statistics I have are from 2014, but. A According to the report that, that came out then, a thousand um, mainly Christian and I think Hindu girls are kidnapped and forced into marriage just in Pakistan every single year. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a cynic. I guess that number has potentially gone up by now. Um, with regards to your website and the database and, and things like that, and then we'll get onto something hopefully a little less um, unpleasant, I guess. Um, where would you suggest somebody start? So if somebody was to watch this and even maybe to try to disprove what we're saying, um, start to look into it. I mean, ha where would you say is the place to start? Would it be with the Quran verses? Would it be with the tafsirs? Would it be with news reports? Because unfortunately, the mainstream news seems pretty deaf and blind uh, to these stories. So where would you suggest they start? If you want to start in terms of understanding that Islam has doctrines of war and is not a religion of peace, then yes, you should read the Quran. But the Quran is not so easy to read or to understand on its own. Because, you know, Muslims always say, if you quote violent verses, that you're taking them out of context. But actually, there's very little context in the Quran at all. It's disjointed, it's jumbled, it's unclear. And so you do need the tafsir, the commentaries on the Quran, but the tafsir are very extensive. So I would recommend, if you'll pardon me, uh, my book, The Complete Infidel's Guide to the Quran, uh, my biography of Muhammad, The Truth About Muhammad, 
or a good summary introduction, the politically incorrect guide to Islam. Uh, these are all designed to help people get a basic understanding of what it is about Islam that keeps inspiring terrorism. Uh, certainly you should read Jihad Watch every day if you want to know what jihad activity is going on. But you can't tell whether Islam is a religion of peace or not from the actions of individual Muslims. And this, again, is also a very great confusion nowadays. Uh, if you go to my Wikipedia bio, it's full of distortions and half-truths and lies. And one of the main ones is, is that I'm an anti-Muslim author. And I think, what on earth is anti-Muslim about telling the truth about the contents of the Quran and Sunnah? What on earth is anti-Muslim about standing up for human rights, even for Muslim women who are denied those rights under Islamic law? There's nothing anti-Muslim about fighting against jihad violence and Sharia oppression any more than it was anti-German to fight World War II against the Nazis. It's, it's a ridiculous charge, but people don't understand the distinction because they think, well, this Muslim friend I have, he's a nice guy, so therefore Islam must be a religion of peace. Actually, he might be a nice guy for other reasons. He might not be paying attention to the violent verses in the Quran, but they're still there. And so you need to first understand what is taught in Islam. And then you can look at whether individual Muslims are living out those, path, those teachings or not. Yeah, I for sure, um, I don't, anti-Muslim for me is a ridiculous statement anyway, because Muslims make up like over a billion people. So it's just the same, you know, it, it's the, you, even the most prejudiced person can't be anti a whole set of unique individuals in a group that large. I mean, to say anti-Islam, anti-Quran, anti-Jihad is a more um, potentially accurate description. I don't mean for you, just for anybody who disagrees with having their hands and feet cut off from opposing sides of their bodies, you know, just being killed, having their heads chopped off, that sort of thing. But also there's a deeper, um, prejudice even within the statement of, of calling you anti-Muslim because it presupposes that these Muslims agree with the violence that you're saying is in the Quran which anyone with an eyeball and an internet connection or a copy of the Quran like a hard copy can see is actually there so to say you're anti-Muslim presupposes that these Muslims um, are actually you know all of them promoting the jihad that you you are anti-jihad as, as we all should be uh, quite frankly so coming on, um, I think I could safely say that I was very surprised to see you in an episode of Islamicize Me. I, I did a, one of those kind of double takes. I thought it can't be. And then I thought, no, it is. Um, so, I mean, tell me a little about that. And also, what do you do to try to, I mean, are you just inured to the constant stream of of you know jihad related uh, research and news do you, like what do you do other than that or off to kind of try and unwind as it were oh well there's no doubt that uh, i have to uh, make it a point to get up from here to forget about it uh, uh, obviously if there's breaking news then i come back and put it up at jihad watch but otherwise uh, i put up 10 posts a day 10 different articles about various things that are going on, and that's that. End of the day for, for Jihad Watch. And then I uh, turn to other things, other interests. I, as a matter of fact, have just published a new book that is my first one that's not about Jihad at all. It Congratulations. Is called America's Presidents. Thank you. This is uh, a book, obviously, it'll be of more interest to Americans than to Brits, but it's uh, designed to counteract the left's war on history, which you saw in uh, the recent attack on the Churchill statue there. And uh, it's the same thing, of course, here with uh, American heroes like Abraham Lincoln and even Frederick Douglass having their statues attacked by people who want to make us ashamed of our history, ashamed of our heritage, ashamed of our countries. So in Rating America's Presidents, I go through each one on the basis of whether they were good for America and Americans. Uh, you could do that for any country, of course, rate the prime ministers, and then uh, all of the recent ones, without any exceptions, would be very bad for uh, Britons and bad for the world in general. 
on the same idea of the first duty of a head of state ought to be to serve his people or her people and make uh, their lives better. But uh, our leaders to a tremendous degree in recent years have been failing us on both sides of the ocean. Yeah, with regards to Winston Churchill, again, I don't literally uh, remember a time when he was in power. What strikes me as absolutely odd is that he was literally Antifa, if you want to use the word Antifa as anti-fascist. He literally fought uh, the fascists. Um, nobody, I, I don't believe anyone ever commissioned a statue to celebrate his home life, his personal views on any particular religion, on uh, maybe his drinking too much. Nobody, like his statue is there. I, I know that at least 30 years ago, he was voted in a poll of, I think, a million Brits the greatest Britain to ever live. Not the greatest prime minister, not the greatest wartime, but the greatest Britain to have ever lived. And this, I mean, we've got a long history of being Britain, as it were. So we've got many more to choose from than maybe Australia or the United States. And yet there he is um, at the top of that poll. I don't understand this idea that by trying to erase history, the only, the only thing I see coming from uh, modifying or altering or making it more palatable to certain, um, you know, uh, wings of politics. The only thing I see is a danger of repeating the same mistakes again. Um, Churchill himself said, if you're not a liberal when you're young, you're heartless. But if you're not a conservative when you're older, you're basically brainless. Um, and I think that is the case as people uh, mature. Uh, but, I mean, there are many factors involved, but potentially they, they become more concerned and um, desiring of uh, prudent fiscal policy, just, you know, uh, national security, things that, you know, young people shouldn't have to worry about, quite frankly. But we also have the case, um, you know, just in this country where politics seems to have, the names are, are almost meaningless. It, from my like humble non-political opinion, it seems to me anyone vaguely to the right of Chairman Mao is clearly a Nazi. Um, I went in a church picking up on something you said earlier before the lockdown and I saw a poster on the notice board, which I couldn't believe. I wish I'd have taken a photo. I won't name the church or the denomination, but it said that certain church um, and LGBT unite. And if I'd have had a pen, I'd have written on the bottom, has God changed his mind? Because as, as you, I'm sure you're aware, God doesn't hate um, the sinner. For sure, he wouldn't have died for the sinner if he did. He detests the sin. And it's, in my opinion, it's no greater sin than lying, which God says is an abomination unto him, um, or any of the other sins. It's, it, so there's no need to exclude or, or be hateful towards people who have that, um, issue, but there's also no need for a recognized global church to stand up and say, we stand with, because I mean, the L's on their own were getting on with things. I mean, you know, the, then the G's and the B's and now the T's. I mean, I don't know where it ends. It, it just reminds me of the emperor's new clothes when men are being made woman of the year. Um, where does it end? And, and if you say anything, potentially you're hateful or far right or racist that's the anything makes you a racist it like it i could go on forever here but i've been saying it for a couple of years now if i can join islam tomorrow as i could um obviously i'd need a bit of a transplant as it were because i i know too much about it but i my dna wouldn't change my race doesn't change i mean it, it's not Jewishness, it's not something, it's not coming from the line of somebody. It's, um, it's, a, it's a free choice or something you're born into. So I don't know how you can be a racist when there are obviously Muslims of many, many different races. Right. Um, it's just another way to try to manipulate us yeah. and make us ashamed of uh, speaking out against this. If uh, people who spoke out against jihad violence were called heroes, then there would be lots of them because people want to be heroic. But if you call them racists, then everybody runs the other way. And so what do the people want who are calling, this, calling us racists? They want more jihad violence and more Sharia. 
because they want to stigmatize everybody who speaks out against them. And obviously it's absurd, as you've noted, you wouldn't, you, if you converted, you wouldn't change race. And Muslims are not all of all one race. There are Islamic jihadis who are not all of one race. There are white ones and Asian ones and black ones and everything else there is, whatever, there, whatever new races there are today. And they, uh, they come in all colors. So it's an absurd charge, but it is designed to inhibit people from resisting jihad violence. That's the whole goal here. Yeah, and of course, if people who spoke up against jihad or um, jihadi attacks were labeled heroes, that would uh, presuppose that their governments were not being heroic because if they were, um, you know, uh, out of the ordinary, so to speak, which they are, to be fair, and I don't think it's, uh, it's mainly the backlash, but it's, it's it seems to me that the education systems even have been infiltrated to such a degree where it's um it's not even spoke it's the presumed uh oh, will of academia like i i, I study uh, at university and sometimes the intrinsic message that's there and the presumptions just that everybody must surely any reasonable person will go along with it. and i think for one where is it in a in a tutor's or it's not the tutor the course material how is it their place to presume such things because they're not um small matters for people who actually take the time to look into things because you could go down a rabbit hole of complete nonsense um you know certain things have been declassified as mental illnesses reclassified as mental illnesses the statistics don't change the suicide rate for transgender people sadly like nobody's celebrating this fact is pretty much the same pre and post op um and just the fact that it's such a high suicide rate means that even if it's declassified body dysmorphia something still is is awfully wrong and it can't all be put at the door of society no not many people are that bothered to be honest how people live their lives behind closed doors i personally you know i'd like them to come to salvation the same as i'd like anybody else but what people do at home, if it's legal and, you know, consenting, what, I'm not interested. So to put it at my feet that, you know, as a member of society, we are the cause for the, for the awful um, suicide rate is preposterous to me anyway. Uh, I just stopped ranting there for a second. Right. You're my last, right. Yeah. My last what? question. Sorry, yes. carry on, please. No, just uh, that this is something that is very common nowadays, that any situation that can be manipulated to serve their agenda, it's done. Uh, you take, for example, I know that you don't play baseball in Britain, but uh, I, you asked me before, what do I do when I'm not doing this? Well, I used to watch a lot of baseball, but now baseball has, like everything else, because there's this totalitarianism that is rapidly advancing in the United States, and I believe in Britain as well, uh, baseball has become so tremendously politicized and so far left that I don't watch it anymore. But I noted that uh, they just started, it was delayed, the, the beginning of the baseball season was delayed because of the virus. And they just started playing a few weeks ago, and the players were given the option of not playing this year since it's the truncated season and the virus is still among us. So one player issued a statement saying he was not going to play this year, not just because of the virus, but because of the systemic racism in American society. And he invoked as an example of that, that there are so few Black Americans who play baseball as if Major League Baseball is keeping Black Americans out, keeping Blacks out in general, because they're racist. When actually, it's, a, it's just a, a fact of life that Black Americans prefer basketball and football in general, and very few of them play baseball. It has nothing to do with racism whatsoever. They would be completely welcome to play professional baseball if they were good enough, and many of them are. But this is not a racial issue, but everything nowadays is used to make us feel guilty, to feel ashamed, and to be on the defensive 
and then we can be manipulated into doing what the elites want us to do. Yeah. And those are the reasons behind, that's the reason behind all these charges of racism and bigotry and Islamophobia and all of it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just had a kind of image in my mind of the Olympics where I think Hitler was there. Um, I think it was Jesse Owens. So there's no, like, I don't see um, athletics particularly running and, um, you know, just certain field areas of athletics are overly represented or underly represented. But the thing with equal opportunities, which is ridiculous, if anyone stops to think about it, and that's probably a crime just saying that, is that equality of outcome is not to be desired. I don't want to be a football player. I just don't want to. I want to be an they, apologist they, for Christianity. 50% of the football players now have to be women in all the major football leagues. It, oh, would, I mean, it would lower you. the quality of the play. Yeah. And this is the problem that you, in sports, the people who are, who, who are trying to play, um, they're trying to win. Mm -hmm. And anybody who thinks, well, I don't want to win with a black man on the team. I'd rather lose with a white man on the team. He's going to lose. And it would be absurd. Yeah. And so that's actually one of the least racist elements of, of, of Western societies, even if there's racism elsewhere, which yeah. I'm not granting. I don't really think it's a large phenomenon nowadays. But uh, these things are pushed on us. These themes, these, uh, these, this propaganda is pushed on us everywhere. I think the sporting industry is one of the most merciless um, in terms mm -hmm. of wanting the best talent, regardless of who is in possession of that talent. The amount of money that goes into the advertising and the venues and the, um, you know, like the sweat tops and the, just the, the pay packet of a UK footballer, a soccer player, um, it, in comparison to maybe a doctor or a surgeon is, is ridiculous. You could never earn that amount of money, but still, the, so in terms of equality, the opportunity is the thing that must be equal. And um, people shouldn't yeah. be, um, regardless of their color at all, um, brought up in, in households or areas that are so poverty ridden that they can't um, study uh, sufficiently at school. They can't, you know, have the, uh, have the luxury of being able to then try out for sports. But other than that, so the opportunity needs to be there and that's, that's a, a socioeconomic problem in terms of poverty because there are black areas that are underfunded just as there are other areas. Other areas are available as it were. Like it's not exclusively a black or white or Asian problem. Um, equality gonna, of opportunity yeah. should absolutely be guaranteed, but equality of outcome can never and should never be guaranteed. It would completely destroy pretty much every profession if you say that uh, a certain number of this demographic and a certain number of women and a certain number of these people, they have to be doctors. Well, would you want to go to a doctor who was only a doctor because he was a particular color or whatever else, it, 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 it's absurd. And uh, yet, on the, uh, unfortunately, it's more and more of a popular idea. I think it's being pushed. I'm going to end on this because um, actually my battery's low and stuff. But I think it's being pushed as the main problem. So there are recent instances, I don't really want to go into them, um, but where racism has been cited. And when you actually look into it, it's nothing to do with it whatsoever actually um, but it can be pushed because it's a well-known idea everybody's comfortable with calling someone a racist most times other than recognizing that even from psychological studies in the 50s in and out group preferencing includes race it does it's not solely restricted to that it could be because you're a you're a boy and I'm a girl it could be because someone's a Jew and I'm a Christian like there are many times when you have a preference to your family, for your wider community, for your society. Um, but race can be pushed because other um, forms of differences that are not genetic, that are not inherent, that are being touted as you're born this way, when we've recently seen that in terms of homosexuality, you aren't born that way. So whilst we can all be looking over here at the racism angle, other things can be normalised and pushed into um, the mainstream where everything seems to just die a horrible death in terms of ideas and any goodness in them. Right, I don't want to end on a down. Um, 
but it seems to be the case. Um, do you have any uh, closing words, anything you'd like to say? I'll for sure put the links to your books and stuff like that in the description. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank you. Today is never give up. As bleak as the, the situation may be, we do have the truth on our side. And the lies cannot prevail over the truth indefinitely. It may take a great deal of effort and a great deal of sacrifice for the truth to prevail, but ultimately it will. Well, Christians know that anyway. Christ is the yeah. truth. Even the, uh, I think even the Quran or the Hadith say that Allah will make Christians uh, superior until the day of judgment. So I don't know how that's reconciled by scholars, but, and I don't believe them anyway, but it's a nice thought. Um, Robert, thank you very much. Hopefully I'll speak to you again soon. After I'll never get through 21 books. It's not with my schedule. <laughs> but, I, but I will for sure do some speed reading uh, quite quickly. And uh, yeah, thank you ever so much. For anybody watching, please like, um, subscribe, share. Go along and look at jihadwatch.org. I hope I'm... Yeah. Yeah, .org. Um, and you'll find some new stories there that I'm, pr I'm guaranteeing you, you won't find elsewhere, um, unfortunately. So thanks ever so much, Robert, and uh, God bless you. Yeah. You too, thank you. Amen.